Welcome to the third video in the series on RNA-seq with Callisto and Sleuth. I've talked about an overview of RNA-seq in the first video, how to use Callisto in the second video, and in this screencast I'm going to talk about doing exploratory data analysis of the data that you processed with Callisto. Sleuth is a library for R that can be used to process and view the data coming out of Callisto and it also takes advantage of the bootstraps that Callisto performs to give you estimates of the technical and biological variants. And all this information, the statistical modeling, the bootstrapping, is all put together in a very user-friendly interface for your exploratory data analysis. So to get started, We'll go to RStudio. I've run a script that produces the sleuth object that contains the experiment. There's not time to go over that now, but that will be part of the lab tutorial later. So for now, I'm just going to focus on sleuth itself. To launch sleuth, I'll type sleuth live. And up comes the sleuth live window. I want to draw your attention first to the diagnostic tools. Sleuth offers several different ways to evaluate your experiment. For example, it contains a mean variance plot. This is a plot of the abundance of transcripts versus the square root of the standard deviation. The blue dots represent an interquartile range, and the red line is the sleuth fit to the data. This gives you a sense of how good your data is fit by sleuth's shrinkage model. And there are also scatter plots. With these, you can scatter any two data sets against each other. So you're looking at the log of the counts per transcript in the 366 sample on the x-axis and the 367 sample on the y-axis. These two samples are biological replicates, so we expect them to be pretty tightly correlated. If I display a sample from the other condition, you'll see less correlation. Now you can see when you scatter those two samples together, they're not as highly correlated. If you scroll down, you can also select individual transcripts by highlighting them, and then you can interrogate the bootstrap standard deviation and raw standard deviation of that transcript in the plot below. You can see the green dot corresponds to this transcript here. You can select some more and you can see the variance of those transcripts. Another useful diagnostic tool is the quantile-quantile plot. QQ plots are a technique for determining if two data sets come from the same underlying distribution. Here we have a theoretical normal distribution on the x-axis and the observed quantiles in the data on the y-axis. Blue is the reference line and the red dots are significantly differentially expressed transcripts given a certain false discovery rate. Next, there are some data summaries. There are density plots that show you about the distribution of abundances. You can see between the two conditions how the abundances are distributed. This is the log of the mean of the transcripts per million. You can change the transformation. You can use estimated counts instead of TPMs. And if you had more than one condition, you could evaluate that here. You can also look at individual samples and how their distributions change. Another summary is the de design matrix. This tells you about at what Sleuth is using for the model for the control and experimental condition. So samples 66, 67, and 68 are considered condition scramble, and samples 69, 70, and 71 are not. You have some information about the samples and the processed data, the number of reads mapped, the number of bootstraps performed. And finally, the Callisto table is a table of the abundances. It's the same as the output txt file from running Callisto. It contains the target ID, sample name, estimated counts and TPMs, and then the effective length and the length. You can search in this table, you can filter it by different ways, and you can decide how many entries you want to look at at a time. Next we have a couple of tools for sample mapping to get a sense of how your samples differ from each other. In this case we're doing principal component analysis of the six samples in this particular data set, 
and you can see that they separate very well by control and experimental condition. All three Hox A1 KD samples are clustered together and the scramble samples are also clustered together. This is a very clean, very high quality canonical data set and this is what you ideally want to see, a very clear separation in the first and second principal component between your samples. Oftentimes reality is not going to be nearly as clear as this and you'll have a more muddied situation, but in an ideal case this is what you'd like to see. You can look at the third principal component if you want all the way to the fifth but in this case, the first principal component contains almost all of the variants in the data. You can also look at the samples by heat map, where the distance between the samples has been measured by the Jensen-Shannon divergence. You can think of this as a type of distance metric, although it's not formally a distance. It is a metric from information theory that tells you something about how closely related the samples are to each other. You can see that the three biological replicates are more closely related to each other than they are between case and control conditions. Again, this is an ideal case, very high quality data, and this is ideally what you want to see. You want to see your biological replicates being much more like each other than like the experimental condition. Now we get to the interesting, more interesting part in the analyses. I'll start with the MA plot. This is a plot of the transcript abundance versus the fixed effect or the fold change. Bear in mind this is not a log 2 fold change, it is a natural log fold change, so you can't report it directly as a log 2 fold change. Now this plot allows you to set the maximum false discovery rate that you'd like to use. Uh, 0.1 is pretty standard or you could use 0.05 and then the plot automatically updates itself. If you have multiple experimental conditions in your experiment, you can select them here. Here you can see there's only one condition. You can change the opacity of the dots so you can see behind them or not, and then the type of fit. Now like that other plot that I showed you, the scatter plot, you can also investigate the variance of the transcripts while you're looking at their expression levels and their fold change. So if I select some of these DE genes here, you can see that the plot below updates with green dots showing where those are in terms of their raw and bootstrap standard deviation. You'll notice that at very high expression levels the variation is very low. As we go to lower levels, even if they're still differentially expressed, your variance goes way up. Additionally, as you select transcripts, they'll be displayed in this table below. Now this table has a lot going on here. You have the transcript ID, the p-value, and then an adjusted p-value or q-value that's adjusted for your desired false discovery rate. You have b, which is the beta value, which is analogous to fold change, and then the standard error of b. You then have mean, which is the mean of the observations across samples, and the variance of those observations. Tech var is technical variance from the bootstraps. Uh, sigma squared is the raw estimator of the variance once the technical variance has been removed. Smooth sigma squared is the smooth regression fit from the shrinkage estimation. Final sigma squared is used for estimating the covariance. And then you have the ensemble gene name and the common gene name. And you can search in this table as well. Another common analysis is the volcano plot. This is a plot of beta versus the log of the significance. So your highly significant DE genes or transcripts are up here in this part of the plot. And you can select them as before and they'll appear in this table below. Next we have a heat map. In the heat map you can select tra uh, transcript IDs that you're interested in and have them plotted in heat map format against each other. So you'd enter your transcript IDs here and then it would create a heat map for you. Next we have the gene view. This gives you a box plot of the abundances of the transcript mapping to a given gene and their technical and biological variation. So for example, I'll put in notch 1 and say change this to ext gene and say view. Now you can see the transcripts originating from the notch 1 gene. There are three of them in this transcript, it looks like there is significant differential expression. The estimated counts are pretty high, 
and there's far more difference between the two conditions than within the biological replicates. You can see that both biological and technical variance is dwarfed by the uh, difference between the two experimental and control conditions. For the other two transcripts, it looks like they receive very, very few or no counts in the majority of the samples. And finally, we have the transcript view itself. So if I want to look just at this transcript, I'll go back to the plot and pick out a transcript. This one will work. And I'll enter it here, and I'll ask to view it. And here you can see a transcript that is upregulated in the HOXA1 KD condition. It does not appear at all in the scramble condition and suddenly is showing up around 300 counts in the experimental condition. And so that's a way you can get box plots of your transcripts one at a time. So that's it for Sleuth. You can see that it's a very powerful tool for doing quick and user-friendly exploratory data analysis of RNA-seq data coming out of Callisto. I uh, highly recommend it as a tool. Um, you have to become a little bit familiar with R to be comfortable with it, but it's worth it because it is very powerful and, and rapid analysis. So I hope you've enjoyed this video, and thanks for watching.